lecture, okay, is uh, in a sense very practical. Uh, I will give you a lot of examples from practical work uh, that I did uh, uh, in my consulting for uh, UNICEF and other organizations. It is interesting for philosophers. Why? Because people who do practical work uh, almost never take an analytical approach to these concepts. And so when uh, a philosopher look at this stuff, uh, you start asking very important questions about uh, the kind of successes or failures that these people encountered, especially policy intervention. And so I think it's very interesting that the philosophical audience looks at that and thinks about this issue, because again, uh, there are a lot of social epistemology issues, okay, problem, and uh, Unfortunately, not only philosophers uh, do not usually deal with these issues and these problems, but also the people that uh, enact this policy never think of consulting with people who have a nicer and better analytical background. So we're going to look uh, at this today. Okay, uh, I don't know if... Uh, some of you were here yesterday or not, you know, I give a definition of social norm as a rule of behavior such that individuals prefer to conform to it on condition, so it's a conditional preference, on condition that most people in the relevant network conform to it, empirical expectation, most people in the relevant network believe uh, they ought to conform to it, normative expectation. When I say most people, uh, you know, I, I don't use uh, this word casually. Most people means uh, that each of us has a particular threshold, okay? So if I care a lot about fairness, you know, most people for me may mean, you know, not everybody, but maybe like 60% will be enough, okay? If I don't care very much, about a particular norm, like saying wearing a veil, maybe I don't care about that. Then most people, you know, uh, I want to know that there are really many, many people, okay, uh, that there is a lot of social pressure to do that. So threshold may differ for different people. Let's keep this in mind. Now, given the fact that people have social, i.e. empirical and normative expectation and conditional preference, how can we change social expectation or how can we elicit new social expectation? Because change is related to that, okay? Now, there are very common features to norm creation and change. I talk of, of creation and then I will talk of emergence because often they are two separate things. Norms are typically created when there is a collective action problem. Okay? So when there is a tension between what is individually beneficial or rational for a person to do versus what is beneficial for the community. And uh, I will go over that extensively. Second, non-creation and change involved shared reasons people may ha should have, sorry, should have reasons for change. We don't change behavior without a reason. But these reasons, we're talking of social behavior, have to be shared. And how to share reason is a very important issue. It's not that obvious that we come to share reason for change. Last but not least, the change in expectation must be collective. I may change my expectations, let's say, but if you don't change yours, okay, <laughs> I may change, let's say, my beliefs, uh, normative, factual. I may change uh, my expectation in the sense that, well, I may come to believe uh, that people are changing, but, and here there is uh, this uh, sort of uh, common knowledge issue 
if uh, I'm not sure that you see the situation as I see it, that you all see the situation as I see it, there is a problem. I'm not going to move. And actually, uh, what I call this situation later on will be too much knowledge, too little action. <laughs> We can have a lot of knowledge, but we won't act on that knowledge. Again, these are social situations. Finally, action, change has to be coordinated. Because if change is not coordinated, remember we're talking of social norm, we're talking of normative expectation, we're talking of the risk of being sanctioned if you disobey the norm, if you transgress the norm. So not only expectations have to be collectively you know, changing, but action out of the norm has to be coordinated. Now, how to coordinate it is a crucial, crucial problem that uh, you know, has not been really successfully solved in many cases. Now, social norms may emerge, OK? quite spontaneously out of customs or simple descriptive norms. And there are two situations in which a social norm may form out of these. One is signaling and the other is elimination external. Let's look at signaling. Sometimes a practice, you know, a common practice or a pure convention acquires a special meaning, becomes symbolic of something, okay? So a behavior may come to signal identity of a group, social status, power. So when a behavior that uh, was born, you know, that there is a, a nice paper by Jerry Mackey on foot binding in China and how foot binding emerged, and it was a purely conventional thing, but then it became a signal okay, of uh, high status, marriageability, and so on, and so it became a social norm, okay? So when, you know, a certain behavior acquires this meaning, this signaling meaning, failing to engage in it may be seen as a rejection, an offense, a negative behavior. And in this sense, of course, uh, will be reproached, uh, reprimanded, and so on. Think of tattoos, <laughs> okay? There is a very nice uh, TV series uh, in the US uh, that talks about these basically gang members. And there is an episode in which uh, somebody, you know, uh, betrays the gang, is out of the gang. And what they want to do is to burn his back, <laughs> to burn his tattoos, <laughs> okay? Why? Because the tattoo is uh, a crucial signal, a crucial sign of belonging, okay? And therefore, if you don't belong anymore, we want to destroy any symbol, any sign of uh, belonging. And in fact, within gangs, tattoos are very important, are a, ve a very important signal of uh, belonging and have acquired, obviously, a completely different meaning. Now, Zimmel, you know, the great German sociologist, had a fantastic example about greeting, okay? What he says is, uh, you know, greeting people on the street began as a pure conventional, you know, habit. Okay, you greet people, say hi. But eventually, failing to greet an acquaintance acquires a very negative meaning. Things like indifference, displeasure, hostility. So what was born as uh, you know, a conventional sign becomes a social norm. And he's very clear about that. And it's very interesting when he talks about that. And in a very similar uh, line, the great historian Norbert Elias, who talks about manners and how manners develop, is a wonderful book called The Court Society. Table manner, you know, you know, the beginning where you put the fork or the knife is not very important, but at a certain point it becomes a signal of nobility, of becoming, of being a member of the upper classes. And not doing that is seen as a great offense. Okay, so it's another example of how a social norm 
emerges out of a simple convention. I'm talking of emergence, not of creation, mind. Norm may emerge to eliminate externality. Hume has a very nice passage about the rules of property. Okay? He said, you know, it's uh, Hume, you know, we would, we would tell today he was an evolutionary theorist. He has an evolutionary idea of how society and institution, you know, emerge and progress. And basically, uh, you know, what he calls convention or, or property emerge to eliminate all the negative external effects that may be embedded uh, in uh, having uh, acquiring property, you know, out of my own labor, let's say, but being uh, in a risky situation because people may, you know, steal from me, etc., etc. And so people agree uh, to have uh, certain rights and rules. Now, and uh, here we come to norm creation. Very often, people create norms. And when do norms, uh, when uh, do we need norms? One is uh, the social dilemma typical situation, is a situation in which uh, what benefits me may not benefit at all my community. And this is true for every member of the community. And one great example I will talk a lot is open defecation. <laughs> Why do I talk about open defecation? First of all, it is a huge sanitation problem all over the developing world, huge. Lot of work has been done to eliminate it, very few successful attempts. And I try to analyze why, you know, what's wrong with it? What are, if you will, the epistemic <laughs> condition <laughs> that made something successful or very unsuccessful, okay? So OD is a typical case in which, you know, is a custom actually, but what benefits me may really damage my community because there is an enormous amount of pollution of water, of land, etc. Again, also not washing hands. There is a huge movement about hand washing, convincing people to wash their hands. And again, you know, uh, transmit diseases transmit bacteria, especially in situations that are very unsanitary to start with. Another typical case uh, is the tragedy of the commons. And uh, here we have uh, a sort of a common good, okay, maybe land, it may be water, and we take from these goods. And if everybody, you know, decides to take irrespective of the need of the community, the good will be depleted, okay? Typical example is use of scarce water, unregulated groundwater extraction, and so on and so forth. So these are typical situations, okay, where norms might emerge, might because they might not. So open defecation, I got interested because uh, I was asked by UNICEF to deal with that. They say, why, you know, we have all these problems uh, with uh, um, incentives, basically. Why we have, uh, you know, these uh, issues, okay? Now, we know, I analyze subsidies in various countries. India, especially, was amazing because economists realized that subsidies did not work, and the answer was too little money. Let's give more money to people. <laughs> and they gave more money, nothing happened. They gave more money, nothing happened. So we know that subsidies do not work. And we know that even uh, Bill Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, built latrines for free in a lot of places. And look what happens to the latrines. <laughs> you know, they use them to keep, uh, you know, bread, you know, wood, it's, they do, people don't use them. So the question is why do they use them, okay? Uh, we haven't convinced them that it's important to use them. What, what's going on, okay? And uh, there has been a very successful set of programs called uh, CATS, CATS. And uh, what is common is the following, and look, I put share, collective, collective, etc., because uh, it's very, very important that these things happen to people together, 
Okay, this is a community. They share, you know, uh, a village. They share the land, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's very important to start with uh, that information is shared within the entire community. The typical model, the typical epistemic model, if you will, is going to each person and give each person information. This is bad because of germs, bacteria, etc. <laughs> and it doesn't work. And it doesn't work not only in this case, but in any case where I've tried, like uh, HIV cases, big disaster. Okay, when you try to give information, to give data, basically, to people, even in a language that they can easily understand. I'm not saying that they, you know, give, uh, you know, data in a very difficult language. The problem is that the information has to be shared. And people have to be convinced uh, that a practice has negative consequences. So if you go to a village in India and talk of germs and bacteria, nobody will listen to you. Okay? So I will show you how, what sort of information is really useful, what sort of things you have to do. Second, uh, very important, factual and normative beliefs have to be, you know, have to change collectively. Again, not one person, not two people, the whole community has to change. And here I, I will talk about that. The third point is the decision to enact change has to be a collective one. Very important. It's not one person that decides, but the whole community has to decide. And third, people are not stupid. Immediately, <laughs> they realize we are in the, uh, that they are in the grip of a social dilemma. They create norms. It's very interesting. You see that over and over again. Actually, Elinor Ostrom got the Nobel Prize for work on this kind of stuff. Okay, I will give you the example, an example of the cow jail, which is a famous example, which is very interesting. So, what works? So, you don't tell people there are germs and bacteria because, you know, they don't understand. And uh, honestly, uh, also, you don't have uh, the authority to be listened to. So what people do is called the walk of shame. And the walk of shame is that they take, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the sheet, basically, and put it in the middle of the village, okay? And then they put food around and wait. And people see that flies go from food, you know, to sheep, basically and they get disgusted. And there are lots of examples in which they elicit pure, simple disgust. So you don't convince people about bacteria, you don't convince people about germs, but you convince them with disgust. So it's very interesting that a strong emotion is elicited. The moment you elicit this emotion, people start thinking, we want to do something different. This has been incredibly successful. So the emo is not so much the cognitive approach, but is an emotional approach. You know, people get disgusted by what they see and get ashamed of doing certain things, practicing certain things that leads to these really, you know, disgusting outcomes. So what happens is that in this successful situation, disgust acts as a drive of change. And people collectively discuss and decide they want to do something completely different. And they build latrines, actually they do. But they immediately realize that people will have a temptation to defect. I have a temptation to go behind the bush, <laughs> you know. You build, the latrines are there, but you know, nature calls. I go behind the bush. So what they do, literally, together, and these uh, are people that don't know anything about social dilemma or collective action, but immediately they see that they have to enact sanctions, immediately. So the, and the sanctions are for people who don't use, don't keep clean, um, basically use and keep clean latrines, okay? And what they do, sometimes they send children around with a whistle, to check people and denounce them, 
or all people go around with sticks and say we will beat anybody who's discovered, you know, doing the wrong thing, etc. Now, what does it mean uh, that they collectively decide to enact sanctions? Internally is negative sanction, externally is positive because they want to have competition between com communities, OD3 communities is a good thing. They form normative expectation. Go back to my idea about social norms, they form normative expectation. People think uh, that I should, that one should use the latrine, okay? And uh, because of the sanctions, etc., they take them very seriously, they observe compliance, they form empirical expectation. Indeed, now people use latrines. So look at my model, you know, you have uh, basically, you know, the normative expectation, and here the normative expectation comes first. With norm creation, you create normative expectation first. Empirical expectation follow. Why? Because people, you know, fear being sanctioned and whatnot. So they will observe compliance and uh, they will have empirical expectation about group behavior. Look at Ostrom. Ostrom is a fabulous example, the story of the cow jail. What's a cow jail? What she said is uh, she studies uh, um, irrigation, how people manage, village people manage irrigation water in Nepal, in the Middle East of Nepal. So she went there and she looked at what they do. And uh, you know, again, there is a social dilemma. You know, people maybe overuse water, okay, or irrigate in the wrong way, they have the right way to irrigate. And so what happens if a person fails to do the right thing? Okay, they all agree, that's very interesting. Again, sanctions are legitimate because people agree on them. They all agree that the person, the defector, if you will, will have a cow taken from him, okay? <laughs> they take his cow and put the cow in a cow jail in the middle of the village. These are several effects. First of all, people know whose cow it is, so they know who the guilty party is. So there is a shameful okay, effect. Second, everyone can milk the cow. The owner cannot, but everybody else can milk the cow. So it's a net economic loss. And third, that the cow stays in the jail unless and until the transgressor pay a fine. Okay? And with this system, they are very successful in controlling irrigation behavior. And again, you know, they have collectively set the rules and the sanctions. They have created normative expectation. They have created empirical expectation that indeed, you know, good behavior is going, uh, is going to happen. So I'm sorry, it doesn't look very nice. So norm creation proceeds in this way. First, uh, you must have a reason to change your factual and personal normative beliefs. And disgust may be a reason, if you are not convinced by a theory of germs, okay? So this change has to be collective, which leads to a collective decision to change behavior. You change and introduce collective sanctions, create normative expectation, and empirical expectation will follow. So with norm creation, Normative expectation must necessarily come before the empirical ones. With norm abandonment is the opposite, is the opposite way, okay? Now, why normative expectation must come first? It seems obvious. Why is it so? Because uh, once uh, we try to solve a collective action problem, there is always a tension between the individual desire Okay, to do things uh, his or her own way, okay, and so take advantage of everyone else versus the benefit of the community. In the case of open defecation, is enough actually that a person starts polluting, uh, you know, to create problems. Okay, so that's why normative expectations are crucial, are the first element in norm creation. Now, what about norm abandonment, norm change? 
Norm change is very important because uh, we live uh, in a world uh, in which there are a lot of negative, harmful norms. And the question is, how shall we change them? What are the means we could use to change them? Okay. And uh, there is obviously a difference, uh, as I preview, about between, sorry, changing, uh, creating, and abandoning a norm it is uh, very important. Norm change, as much as norm creation, involves shared reasons to change. So the reasons to change have to be collectively shared. Expectation have to be changed collectively. You see, I put in red shared, collective, is a group issue. And you need, of course, coordinated action. Without it, nothing is going to happen. So norm abandonment is similar. You have to change shared change of factual and normative beliefs, collective decision to abandon, coordinated action, new empirical expectation, abandonment of old uh, normative expectation. So these steps are the opposite when you create a norm. This is very, very important. I don't know why it looks so, you know, blurred. Okay. Now, this is easier said than done. Because first, uh, to have shared reason to abandon, let's say female genital cutting, child marriage, domestic violence, etc., you must recognize that there is a problem. Okay? And uh, typically, we have several possible situations. First of all, you may not know about possible alternatives. This happens. People think we've always done something like that. I don't have any idea of what else I could do. Second, they don't see any problem with the current norm. It's perfectly fine. Female genital cutting is great. Okay, it's an initiation ritual. We want to continue doing it. Okay, so they defend their ways as superior. The third issue is pluralistic ignorance. As I explained yesterday, pluralistic ignorance is a situation where my personal normative beliefs and my normative expectation diverge. And so basically the perceived consensus is very different from objective consensus. In a sense, this is an easier situation if uh, we can you know, be trusted in giving messages about what people really think. Okay, change is easier here than uh, B is very difficult, okay? But all these A, B, C are reason to resist uh, even discussing certain practices. People don't want to talk about them, okay? Now, norms typically do not stand alone. I don't have time today, I have a new paper on norm scripts and schemata about the cognitive underpinning of social norms. But the fact is uh, that norms are not isolated, are part of a very rich web of beliefs, values, other norms, and uh, what you know we call scripts. I'm coming to that in a second. So look at, let me, let me uh, give you an example. Breastfeeding, big problem. Most African countries, women who give birth don't breastfeed immediately. Why? Factual beliefs. Colostrum is dirty. It's very bad for the child. The child is a honorable guest and needs water. And the water is usually very dirty and dangerous. The kids die of dysentery. Okay? They obviously have positive attitude. If I have this factual belief, I will have a very positive attitude towards the practice. Okay? I will have normative belief, you know, what a good mother should do. Never give first milk, you know. She should give the child, uh, you know, water, basically. There are other norms that support this behavior. There is uh, a well-ingrained idea that you should obey your mother-in-law. The mother-in-law is a keeper of tradition, okay? And there is also a script, what a good mother should do. Who's a good mother? There are a lot of ideas about a, what a good mother should do, but the most important thing is that these things are included 
in the view of the good mother. So if we go back for a moment, you see there are factual beliefs, attitude, normative beliefs. There are supporting norms, obey the mother-in-law, scripts and stereotypes about who a good mother is. They are all go together. And so since they are all go together, when you want to change behavior, you have in some way to change the script. And this is crucial and it's very difficult, okay? So all these are part of what is called, you know, in cognitive psychology, we talk about script and schemata, and these are very important concepts to use with social norm. A schema is a cognitive structure that represents the generic knowledge we have, okay, about people, situation, events, etc. And schemas involve belief, expectation, and even behavioral roles. So what women are, when we talk about gender violence, we have always to think of schemas. Who's a good woman? This is crucial, because you have to change the schema to change violence, okay? So what women are, what we expect of them. Schema involve also reaction to behavior that is unexpected. So in a study of male violence over women, what was very apparent is that men feel that if there is no extenuating circumstance, a woman who does not fulfill the expectation of a good wife should be punished. Not only is the right of the husband to punish, is his duty. It is very sad, but this is goes on <laughs> in the mind of many people, actually, this happen all over the world, okay? What is a script? I, I talk of the young mother script. Is a schema for social events, for particular behaviors. So what does a young mother do? What she's expected to do? How she feeds the child, okay? Uh, how she treats the child, how she interacts with her husband and mother-in-law, etc. And typically, script include uh, stereotype stylized sequence of, uh, of action and define action and roles. So what a new mother does is a script, okay? So it is very, very important to realize that norms don't stand in isolation. They are part of script and schemata. And when do we want to enact change? We have to think about that. Okay, so if a norm is part of a larger script, then often we may need or want to change the script in order to change the norm. This has been done about female genital cutting. In most of the places where female genital cutting is practiced, there is a very important and uh, well-established culture of honor. Honor is crucial. And in all culture of honor, honor lies in women's bodies. Okay? So a man has to control the women. <laughs> okay? And honor and purity are crucial concepts. So are, are you going uh, to challenge these concepts? Better not. The important thing uh, is uh, to challenge the connection between female genital cutting and honor. There is a very, very successful campaign called Salima in Sudan that does exactly that. They challenge the connection between honor and purity and female genital cutting. They invented a word called Salima, okay, because an uncut woman was called Halfa, whore. Basically, there is only one word, and that was a word. They invented a new word, which means God-given body, full you know, a, a body which is untouched, which is in some sense close to the idea of purity and honor. And uh, it was a very successful campaign. And again, what they did, they did not change crucial elements of the honor script. They just changed some beliefs that are part of it. So that honor is not necessarily attained through cutting the genitals, but honor can be attained uh, in other ways, okay? And actually, people got convinced, okay? Now, it is uh, very important, of course, uh, you know, to change uh, the supporting beliefs 
given a certain practice, okay? And various ways to intervene have been thought, educational campaign, media campaign, laws. There are laws everywhere and, you know, they are more or less successful. Intensive group communication. I want to focus on communication because communication and deliberation are crucial activities when you want to change, to produce an epistemic change. It's very, very important. Okay, people don't think in isolation, especially with social phenomena. People have to think together. Okay, so the goal is collectively change factual and personal normative beliefs. Problem, factual beliefs may be very hard to change. We saw that with open defecation, okay, you know, they had beliefs about it's perfectly fine or, uh, you know, uh, women who don't give the first meal to kids, they say it's bad, <laughs> okay, so they have a lot of factual beliefs about that, and you want to change them. The problem is that even if I convince a young mother or a group of young mother, look, what they're doing is wrong, you know, you should, you know, give the colostrum because, etc., etc. suppose I convince them, will they change behavior? And, oh, why? because there is still the mother-in-law, <laughs> okay? There is still the village, the husband. There are still a lot of people in the reference network that think otherwise. So just uh, pushing for information to get through is not a good idea, okay? It's not a good idea because, again, these are interdependent collective behavior, and the kind of epistemic change must take that into consideration. This is very, very crucial, okay? So we have, again, collective action problems. Now, belief change. Some beliefs are false, some beliefs are true. So the colostrum story is clearly a false belief, okay? And so we have to change this belief, and changing the belief, we change the attitude, you know, toward the practice. Now they think that the practice is bad. Changing belief is easier said than done. But what happens when beliefs are true? Child marriage. If I marry my daughter at 18, the dowry price will go incredibly high. I don't have money. If I educate my daughter, she will not find a husband. Men don't want women that are more accomplished than them. She will not find a job. I have spent money for nothing. Okay? So these are absolutely true beliefs. So how do we change? You can change the belief. You have to change the attitude. You have to change the idea, again, the script of what a good woman is. Now, suppose beliefs are false, like the colostrum. So there are three ways to change them. Direct evidence. So, for example, this has happened. You observe that vaccinated children don't get HIV, because one very important thing, this happened in Uganda. People were convinced to vaccinate their children, and then the word spread that foreigners, i.e. Americans, <laughs> were vaccinating children uh, to inject them with HIV, so that they would, they would die, basically. From one day to another, vaccination stopped in Uganda. So people believe that, okay? So it is very, very important that, you know, you try to make people observe that vaccinated children are healthy, okay? Of course, people may say, yes, they are healthy now, but what about five years from now? <laughs> okay, this happens, <laughs> okay? So it's very, very important, uh, you know, to look at direct evidence and inference. So you look, for example, one other idea is that if you vaccinate a child, the child will become sterile. They will have no children on their own. This is a big, big tragedy in many countries. And again, inference, vaccinated population are not sterile. So direct observation and inference may, may work. A very important thing is testimony, okay? Very often we don't think about testimony, but it is very important in this situation because direct evidence and inference, people can object. You know, they can say, yes, as I said before, yeah, yeah, for a year or two <laughs> it will work, but then what happens? So if they recognize the source as somebody who knows what he or she is talking about or is a trusted authority, 
people will believe much more easily, okay? More than directly observing or inferring. Now, the interesting thing about the trusted authority is who is a trusted authority? You know, how is trust built? And this is very important in testimony. You have to understand who's giving the message, okay? Is it an, an American nurse coming to the village? It wouldn't work, okay? It must be somebody from within. So it must be a credible source. And a credible source is typically a source that has no interest in spreading this information. People must feel that there is no second motive, basically. And it must be authoritative. And what authoritative mean? It doesn't mean that there is a foreign doctor, maybe the local uh, medicine men, and very often local medicine men have been used, uh, you know, been convinced, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or it may be the local religious leader, okay? But it must be an authoritative source. Big problem, I am an authoritative source. And I tell you something that goes really against what you believe. I risk losing your trust. So a fine line with testimony, there is a very fine line between being authoritative, being trusted, and possibly losing trust because you send a message that is not, you know, something that they can easily accept. So this is very interesting. And uh, I've seen cases, uh, especially like village leaders are very reluctant, uh, even if they believe these things, to spread certain message because they fear, you know, that their authority will be put into discussion. Now, what happens if beliefs are true? So the older gir the girl, the bigger the dowry. Educated girls, she goes to school until 18, who will find a husband for her? You know, very difficult to find a good husband. In lots of parts of uh, the developed world, this is the case. And so the attitudes have to change in this case because the beliefs are absolutely true. You have to change the script, okay? And changing the script uh, is quite a difficult thing to attain. It's easier in a sense, uh, to change uh, false beliefs uh, than, uh, you know, to convince people that things can change, can, things can be difficult, different. Now, uh, there are three problems uh, that I want to mention. One was mentioned yesterday, lack of awareness, okay? What does it mean, lack of awareness? We are unaware of our beliefs, okay? Uh, it's not that I have, you know, in my mind, a list of all the beliefs I have. Sometimes I realize I have certain beliefs because you make me notice, Christina, you're acting in that way, why? And I say, oh, I must believe that, okay? Social norms are automatically followed. I wrote about that, okay? Are followed as default rules. People don't think, oh, this is a social norm. I have certain expectation, conditional preference. We don't think this way. So social norms, uh, are most of the time automatically followed. People don't question their expectation. They are there, okay? And in order to change, uh, we need awareness. Awareness is very, very important. How do we reach awareness? This is uh, a crucial step that we're going to discuss. Now, legislative intervention, when they are successful, a law will signal that something, uh, so there is a signaling function to the law, apart from the punishing function, etc. The law signals that something should change, that something is unacceptable. And uh, there have been studies in particular uh, by um, an American legal scholar called Stoons uh, that did a lot of study about the relationship between norms and laws. And what it shows is that the, if the law is very far from the norm, the law will be thrown away, basically. People will not obey the law. Not only that, but the police will not, you know, make people respect the law because the local norm is much more important. So law can signal, but alone, they are not very powerful. Educational and media campaigns, you know, are always used. You know, they may or may not be successful, but typically they have to combine with other things. I am a big supporter of soap operas. 
Why am I support that? Are good soap operas, of course. Why, you know, say they are idiotic? <laughs> Why do you support soap operas? Because in soap, in a good soap opera, the character is somebody people can identify with. And when I say we have to change the script, the soap opera shows a different script. And soap operas, they have done a lot of studies about soap operas in Brazil, and they had an enormous effect on behavior, like fertility declined precipitously in women of a certain age, and the age of the protagonist of the soap opera that refused to have more children, okay? And uh, it's very interesting because people can identify with the character. The character for a long time goes through a lot of issues, problems, troubles, etc. And a good soap opera shows a different script. So people can be aware of their own script, can see that there is a possible difference there, there is an alternative. They get conscious of the alternative, okay? And also another very important part of soap operas is publicity. People talk about what happens in the soap opera. People talk about that, okay? And so there is a sort of diffusion, discussion, okay? Understanding that there are alternatives and we discuss the alternatives and so on and so forth. Similar to soap operas is community-driven theater. Of course, uh, you know, the, the, the possibility of having great success uh, is limited to a village, <laughs> okay? While soap operas, you know, can, uh, can reach uh, an enormous number of people. And uh, linked to this, actually, is intensive verbal group communication. So it's very important that people to become aware of something, are exposed to something different, but also can communicate with each other because it's through communication that this collective change is going to happen, okay? Again, I, I'm always thinking of the discussion we had about we intentions, <laughs> etc. And, uh, you know, in this case, I would say that uh, there is a give and take between the individual okay, change uh, of beliefs uh, and the shared collective element that leads to change, okay, because my change in my beliefs will affect nothing. The change has to be collective, okay. I said another problem is coherence. We don't like to hold incoherent beliefs, well known, okay we tend to reject information that is incoherent with our beliefs. Okay, there is a confirmation bias. I don't want to listen to what you're telling me. You know, I believe these things and that's it. So how can we change what I call a cautious audience mind? Okay. We can persuade with argumentation. And the interesting thing is uh, that we have example of people that persuade each other with argumentation. So the debate, the collective discussion is very important because first of all, it may unearth incoherences, okay, within my own beliefs. Okay, when I discuss with you, I say, Christina, there is a problem here. And, you know, I may, help you unearth your own incoherences, and there will be a collective tendency to become more coherent. And uh, this uh, is work done by Hugo Mercier um, and Dan Sperber. They've done a lot of work exactly on this, and Hugo and I have worked together on uh, uh, exactly on this issue. The third is a confirmation bias. We favor information always, and this has happened to any one of us that confirms our beliefs, okay? I'm going to fish for information that confirms my beliefs. I don't like inf uh, uh, information that disconfirms my beliefs. And uh, this is very interesting uh, because uh, this leads to biased interpretation. And uh, the best example was given to me by this uh, UNICEF participant who wrote a paper about the Myanmar child law. And the there is a lot of violence against children. People beat their children like there is no tomorrow, basically. And the law says, willfully maltreating a child with the exception 
of the admonition by a parent, teacher, or a person having the right to control a child, which is for the benefit of the child. So here we have a confirmation bias. Suppose that I, I beat my child. I think it's very good for their education, OK? Is uh, the stick theory. And there is a law that tells me this. How am I going to interpret the law? It's very interesting. Uh, because if uh, my parenting script, a good parent, includes corporal punishment, this is not violence, first of all, okay? It's just corporal punishment. And uh, basically, if uh, I am, let's look at the law again, willfully maltreating a child. I'm not willfully maltreating my child when I punish the child with the stick, okay? This is not violence, and so, People will think, I'm not violating the law. I'm doing the right thing. So it's very interesting uh, that when a message is conveyed, it has to be the right message. And exactly because there are all these biases that we have, uh, the message has to be very clear. Okay? This is a very ambiguous message, you know, open to interpretation, confirmation bias. People will keep beating their children. This is not violence, this is education. Okay, so what we need uh, is changing the script of what a good parent does. Okay, convincing people that good parenting does not mean beating the child. You don't obtain good results. Okay, this is easier said than done. There is a huge study about uh, parental violence uh, in various countries, Italy included. Italy is one of the countries where there is a lot of violence against children. I don't know this country, but Italy is staggering. The data are terrible. <laughs> and again, the idea is, uh, you know, you have to change uh, your attitude, basically, towards parenting. What does it mean to be a good parent? Now, intensive verbal group deliberation. So why deliberation is important? Why we can convince people through the, or they can convince themselves, I should say, through deliberation? First of all, in good deliberation, not deliberation when there is a power, you know, a power problem like women don't talk in front of men, etc. Everybody can express their opinion. You know, we can say what we think. Okay? And uh, we have ample time to interact, so it's not a five minute thing. And we can give uh, argument, counter arguments. We can express. Uh, our belief, we can learn the belief of the, and opinions of other people, and we can unearth contradiction in our beliefs. Okay? So what are the advantages of deliberation? And this is work uh, I did with, again with Hugo Mercier and uh, that he did uh, with Dan Sperber, who is a big supporter of uh, this type uh, of uh, deliberation. First of all, we can convince people by making them realize that there is an inconsistency in their beliefs, okay? So suppose you want to be a good parent, okay? But, uh, and, uh, you know, you marry your child at 12. Child marriage is people marry their daughters at 12 or 13. They love them. And so, you know, letting them understanding, understand that this involves some risk for the child and good parenting means, as they agree, that you shouldn't put your child to risk, okay? It takes time, but, you know, it's a give and take among people about that. So when people deliberate or discuss among each other, they point out inconsistency in, in each other's belief, okay? And usually they can reach, with discussion, better belief, okay? So there is a help here. People can get coordinated, which is something that I told you before is very important, uh, by making beliefs and attitudes explicit. Remember, awareness okay, is important. They get, you become aware of your belief if you discuss with me and we discuss about parenting, let's say, you become aware of that. You, we become aware of inconsistencies between certain beliefs and other beliefs we hold. And in particular, you know, everything is made very explicit. And uh, whenever people debate and reach a conclusion, they tend to accept the conclusion, okay? Because it was reached autonomously, basically, by discussing with other people. 
Another element which is very important about discussion, collective discussion, is publicity. People reach some sort of common knowledge okay, about what other people think, what sort of conclusion we all reach. We all know that. I know that you know, and uh, you know that I know, and so on and so forth. Okay? We are all exposed, basically, to the same message. Okay? Now, direct deliberation, obviously, is the best way. Okay? But it may be very difficult to do in large communities. It's not that people can <laughs> all get together and deliberate together. And that's why I am a great supporter of good soap operas, because they make people discuss with each other. They show different scripts, you know, and when people discuss, they think, oh, we could do otherwise. Why won't I do otherwise, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how do we know that the beliefs and attitudes are changing? Okay, first of all, through discussion and deliberation, and again, we don't need to think of deliberation in a small group, it can be discussion after a soap opera, we know what other people think. And if I know what other people think and we are changing our script, our belief together, I know that we're changing together. Everybody knows that the collective okay, is changing. It's not just me. Okay? The media campaigns, I think, uh, are important in the publicity sense uh, because uh, we know that everyone is hearing the same message. Okay, again, the publicity element. Everyone is hearing the same message. We can discuss it. Usually people discuss these things. Okay, and uh, what they start perceiving uh, is a shift in beliefs and attitude. And again, this is very public. Okay, if this is accompanied by new laws, uh, good ones, by the way, not like the Myanmar one, <laughs> okay, there is an extra signal that would push people to abandon certain practices. But again, I think legislative intervention are important because they signal something, but they are not the medicine, okay? They are part of a whole, you know, setup. Now, suppose we all discuss, we all agree, you know, that we should use different parenting rules, you know, we, <laughs> we are together in that. Will we change our behavior? Hmm. <laughs> okay, suppose something more serious, that we discuss female genital cutting, which is typically a condition for marriageability in many cases. So we all agree we should change. Okay, we have an open discussion, it lasts a long time, we think we, do, we should change. But unless I'm convinced that all of you are changing, I will be very prudent because my uncut daughter may not find a husband. Okay? So there is a social dilemma here, you know, very present in the idea of social change. So we have a collective action problem. Okay? So I do not want to be the only one that uh, let her daughter uh, let her daughter go to school and then she doesn't find a husband. Yeah, yeah, you're telling me. You know, we're all agreeing uh, that the good thing would be education for women, but then I have to be sure that she will find a husband. Otherwise, she is uh, socially dead, basically. Or even if people tell something but do something else, I will be sanctioned in a negative way if I change behavior and you haven't changed. So there is always a collective action problem. So the epistemic conditions are very, very important. We want to collectively change beliefs. But because we're talking of social norms, there is an action element, okay? So epistemic change does not mean behavioral change. This is very, very important to realize, okay? Because people keep talking of epistemic change in these cases, but, you know, we can discuss and be convinced, but how I trust that you, your son, will marry my daughter if she is uncut? How do I trust you? Okay? And that's what I call too much knowledge, too little action. <laughs> okay? We may have an enormous epistemic change, okay? But 
Suppose that marriage markets norm encourage exogamous marriage. So suppose in our village we're all convinced <laughs> that we shouldn't cut our girls. We talk about that, we agree, but then they have to marry in another village. <laughs> and do I trust you not cutting your daughter <laughs> if she has to marry in another village where you know we don't know what they think? Of course not. There is a big risk. Okay, so typically several communities have to be involved. Okay. Now, this is the last point. We have to coordinate on collective shift. So, even if we have coordinated on epistemic shift, action shift is the last piece of the puzzle. Without it, nothing is going to change. Okay. Now, there is a very interesting success story, which is still being analyzed, and uh, is work done by an NGO called Tostan in Senegal. And Lejeune and Mackie wrote a very nice article about that. Basically, what happens here, I don't want to go into this issue. I'm writing about that also in my new book, Trendsetters. So what happens uh, in these villages, typically, we have small group of trendsetters, people that, you know, get epistemically convinced, okay, we should change behavior. They engage in deliberation, but what they do, you know, they have to proselytize because marriage goes from village to village. So uh, what I always, uh, you know, uh, use as an example is, did the Amish need to proselytize? No, they vote with their feet. Okay, they can sustain their life. So it's a core group that says, oh, is epistemically convinced they don't have a collective action problem. They are all together, they leave their country, they go and colonize some lands in America, and they are happy with that. The problem is if a group cannot be self-sustaining. And, uh, you know, with the exogamous marriages, you cannot be self-sustaining. You have to proselytize. And this is exactly what happened with the core groups. They organize diffusion of deliberation in other villages. So they understand that, that their epistemic changes are not enough okay, to guarantee that there will be an action change, okay, that there will be a real change in behavior. Okay? And what they do, they organize diffusion of deliberation in other villages. And the interesting thing uh, is uh, it can be formally modeled. When a sizable majority is reached, they reach a tipping point. They all change behavior. Okay? So it's a tipping point story of shelling. But the interesting thing uh, is, uh, you know, they have to organize diffusion. They have to reach a majority of villages, okay, that, uh, you know, basically get convinced uh, to change behavior. And uh, this is a great thing. Okay, so we have convinced, uh, we are convinced here, we convince another classroom, <laughs> okay? We convince three classrooms. So we're pretty safe that our daughters, uncut, can find a husband, and our boys will marry an uncut girl, okay? Now, one very important element, okay, is the element of commitment of promising, okay? These people typically promise to each other to change behavior. So it's not just that we are convinced epistemically to change through discussion, you know, belief revision, basically they revise their beliefs, but this is not enough. I may revise all the belief I want if you don't promise to me that, and I know you have revised your beliefs, but will it be stable? You know, there is an issue of sustainability, of stability. And so at this point, uh, what people do is promising. We see a lot of promising. We see a lot of commitment, okay? We, and people stand by what we promise. And uh, an analogy is what we see in behavioral experiment. If we let people chat before they play a social dilemma, very often is a one-shot social dilemma. So they can cheat, is anonymous, but uh, they reach an agreement and promise to each other. I promise to cooperate. They do cooperate. Okay? So we see in games, uh, 
you know, that people in communication typically exchange promises and typically, you know, fulfill their promises. Even when there is no reason to do that, it's anonymous. Nobody will know. Suppose it's a social dilemma with four people, okay? And I have promised to contribute. But then I, I am in front of my little terminal. <laughs> I may not contribute. You will never know that I am the one who didn't contribute, right? So it's very interesting that people promise and they keep their promises. So there is an analogy here because these people typically in deliberation, they come to a certain conclusion and then they promise to each other to stick with that behavior. Okay? So what I want to say is that uh, the epistemic part is crucial. The belief revision, if you will, is crucial, but it's not enough because we're not isolated individuals in the middle of the savanna. <laughs> we are a group. We, we have interest in each other. We have interdependence. And therefore, we need to be sure that the conclusion we have reached will be kept. Okay? Of course, uh, we, we were discussing that at lunch. Why do people keep their promises? You know? What, what's the reason why we keep our promises? Well, in a small community, there is a reputation effect. If I promise, typically, you know, and, uh, you know, don't uh, fulfill my promise, I will, you know, be looked down by people. There is a very strong norm, <laughs> if you will, of uh, keeping your promises. So there are reputation effect. And uh, there is a, a psychological, we know that when I state my viewpoint in front of all of you, it will be much more difficult for me to change it. And this is just a psychological effect. Okay, it has nothing to do with reputation. It's just when I state what I believe, uh, then I don't go back and say, well, you know, I was confused. I didn't really believe that. Okay. And look at this. This happens, you know, this is a story of many villages, okay? And there have been proselytizing, so people went to the core group, went to other villages and convinced people. And so there is a, 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 a huge, you know, phenomenon of belief revision here, okay? And they promise within their own group. But now I have to be sure that the other villages, you know, are behaving well in the sense that people in this village will marry my daughter that is uncut. And so what they do is amazing. You know, the representative of the village stands up and say, we promise, you know, we, the village XYZ, promise to stick, you know, to this uh, uh, agreed upon behavior. So there is a lot of collective promising. And in many successful intervention, collective promising has been a very important element. Of course, the epistemic element is very important. People have to change their beliefs, and there are many ways to do that. But the important thing is once they have changed their belief, they must be sure okay, that change is coming. They must be sure that other people are basically changing too. Again, because there is interdependence. We're not like the Amish. We vote with our feet and leave and goodbye. Okay, so this, uh, this is one of uh, the interesting examples in which these people within the villages have changed their belief, but they want to be sure that they don't risk, basically. They, we try to eliminate risk, and the collective promise is one thing. So what's happening here? Let's go back to norms and norm change. Empirical expectations are changing. Okay, because I can change all my beliefs you want, but if I'm not sure that you, okay, are behaving, are going to behave differently, I'm not going to behave differently. So the collective promising, ground, share, belief, that change will follow. Okay, so what does it ground? It grounds empirical expectations. And remember, they have to come first, okay? S and we know that when empirical expectation and normative expectation diverge, so suppose that I'm still uncertain, I still think maybe my daughter will be penalized if she is uncut, okay? Maybe something bad will happen to me. 
But at this point, I have this huge promising situation. I have this huge conviction, if you will, that people are changing their behavior. Then my normative expectation decays completely. Okay? And this is how a norm gets abandoned, basically. So the idea is if they do it or they promise, they must support it, and nobody will be punished anymore if uh, uh, we do that. So it's very important to remember, again, that empirical expectation is the contrary of norm creation. With norm creation, normative expectation have to come first because uh, you have to have some form of sanction okay, in order to obey the rule we decided you know, we want to uh, enact or adopt. So in that case, normative comes first. In this case, normative follows. Okay, you abandon the normative expectation because you have changed your empirical ones. Okay? And this is basically what I said. Basically, it's not sufficient uh, to have uh, an epistemic individual change. Maybe the change will be shared, fine, through discussion, etc. We will have a huge belief change, <laughs> but the belief change will not be sufficient to change behavior. I must also change my empirical expectation, be sure that people are behaving differently. And the commitment and the promising is a very, very important element. We've seen it over and over in many different cases. Okay? So individuals must be convinced not only that a certain practice has very negative consequences, they may be convinced, but they must be convinced that many others are abandoning it. So my risk of abandoning it is declines, is very small. So again, if uh, remember all my definition, <laughs> If compliance with the social norm is conditional, we have conditional preference, okay, we need a change in empirical expectations. Okay? This is crucial. And a change in normative, all normative expectation will follow. Sometimes, but not always, a new norm will follow. With female genital cutting, we see that the, they uh, sort of create a new norm, the girl should never be cut. Okay, they get really convinced, it's a change in script. Okay? But in any other cases, think of uh, the sexual changes that we saw in the 60s. Some of you are too young, but I remember. <laughs> and, uh, and again, certain norms of sexual behavior just declined, you know, for certain reference rules, not for everybody, but declined precipitously again. And uh, we had a certain you know, we, we discussed this thing a lot, I remember. So we had a certain conviction that other people, you know, were doing uh, the same thing, you know, were abandoning the old norm, okay? Norm abandonment will involve changing, so belief change, collective decision, depending on this belief change to abandon a practice, coordinated action, okay? And coordinated action may mean uh, collective promising is part of it. New empirical expectation, abandoning old empirical expectation. This is the model that I propose for abandoning a social norm. End, End of story. <laughs> okay. So um, first of all, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I have uh, a question about awareness, but uh, first I, I, I must say something about the cow case uh, yeah. because I, I've never heard about that case um, before and I got a bit puzzled by it because if I understood it correctly, um, what you basically do is to punish the cow for the mistake made by its owner. So the cow is taken away from its, uh, its normal environment put uh, in the middle of the village, and everybody is uh, allowed to milk it. That's not very morally nice, is it? I, I was just thinking about that when you came up with the example. But uh, what I really wonder about is um, uh, the case of awareness. Yes. Uh, so um, I take it that one of your main points is that uh, awareness can be used as a tool for um, change or um, norm Make abandonment. Aware, yes. yes. 
And uh, um, I, I was making an association to the growing literature on implicit biases. So um, one of the things that um, the research on implicit biases shows is that uh, even though there are many things uh, people um, embrace, they do not manage to uh, follow up in action. For example, it is very normal to um, um, embrace gender equality and race equality, etc. And people are very well aware that this is the right thing to do and they want to do the right thing. But when they get to action, they do a lot of things that reveal that they are not act acting in gender balanced ways, etc. Et so um, one thing that seems to work is uh, counter stereotypical behavior. And I was, I was thinking that what you say about soap operas might be one uh, tool uh, showing counter stereotypical behavior. Um, for example, you get the protagonist to act in ways contrary to the standard norm. Right. So I was a bit curious about you can say something about the, the relation between awareness and uh, counter stereotypical exemplars. Yes. Let me start with the cow. <laughs> if you don't think that the cow has a soul, <laughs> you know, you don't penalize the cow. But uh, you penalize the person on two counts. First uh, is uh, uh, the, the, the story she tells uh, is uh, uh, three people in the village and, uh, you know, the three people who monitor, let's say, what's happening, will penalize the fourth by taking his cow. What happens is people know in a village who's the owner of that cow. So there is a lot of public shaming. You know, people will know that guy. Okay, this is one thing. And the second thing is, uh, you know, uh, there is an economic loss because everybody is milking my cow and, uh, you know, I cannot get milk from my cow. So there is an obvious loss. And so this induces the person to pay a fine. It's better to pay a fine than to, put, uh, to be put in that situation. Okay? Is it convincing? Yeah. You are an animal lover. <laughs> No, I am too. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, the the other question, I think, is very uh, is very interesting. Uh, there are studies, uh, and uh, I I look at many of them because I write about it uh, in my new book uh, about um, you know I basically uh, uh, the last chapter is about trendsetters, and I say soap operas are artificial trendsetters. Why? Because they present okay, a person who must be very similar to the target you have. So let's say uh, is a situation where parents don't send the girls to school, they marry them at 13 or 14, etc., etc. So the protagonist of the soap opera is a 13 or 14 year old girl in a very traditional family. But she wants to marry for love <laughs> and she wants to study. And she goes through all the, the uh, very negative things uh, that may really happen. So the family is against her, you know, they tell her you will never find a husband, uh, you will be, at, uh, you know, lost, etc., etc. But she goes through all that uh, and she wins, in inverted commas. So what is important is, as you notice, a change of script. So first of all, all the girls that look at that, you know, become very aware that they may desire, they may aspire to something that sometimes they don't even think they can aspire to. Okay, it's the aspiration level that increases, basically. And uh, they become really aware that it is possible, okay, to change things. It is possible, you know, to have a different life. And uh, we know that very successful soap operas have a huge effect, okay? But the part of the huge effect, I think, is the publicity element. The fact that uh, women, girls, watch, talk to each other. So they discuss the script, basically. And uh, as far as implicit bias goes, uh, so you may say, okay, uh, you know, there are lots of situations where you know, uh, words and deeds are very different. And uh, there, there are fabulous experiments uh, by 
two social psychologists, Gardner and Dovidio, about what they call aversive racism. So they take very liberal people and, uh, you know, they put them to the test <laughs> about racism. And uh, so one experiment, I discussed with somebody else, one experiment is the following. Uh, they went to Brooklyn and look uh, at all people who are registered Democrats and registered Republicans. And then they take, uh, basically, they um, ask them to fill a questionnaire and they take two samples, the most uh, liberal and the most conservative. And then after a few months, you are the most liberal, you, reach, uh, you get a phone call. And the phone call has a clear African-American voice. And uh, this guy says, you know, I'm sorry, oh my God, I spent my last quarter, I'm stranded on the Brooklyn Bridge, can you please call AAA because my car is broken down. And, uh, you know, the conservatives have no problem, they know, <laughs> okay, they listen. The liberals are those that put down the phone before the request is made. So they listen to the voice, they put down the phone. And there are lots and lots of uh, experiments they did and data also with gender in which you see that. So certainly I agree with you that, uh, you know, uh, things may change, but not completely. And uh, I have in the book an example, a wonderful example. In Tanzania, women in, uh, in many places started working. They did not work before. They become provider. And they interview the men about these women who are provider, the husbands. And what the husbands say, they list the things that the wife does. And what they say is where she works very early in the morning and she prepares breakfast for the family. Then she goes to work. Then she comes at noon and prepares lunch for the family. Then she goes back to work. Then she goes to a village, uh, uh, you know, meeting because they are also active in the village and she goes to the meeting. Then she comes home and prepares dinner for everybody. And then she has sex with me. You know, she has to, if she's a good wife. So it's very interesting uh, that the script of the good wife has changed, uh, includes working, but the basic characteristic of what a good wife is has not changed, okay? And this may happen with women and blacks, uh, and there, there are lots of studies about uh, script and schemata change that show, you know, how difficult is, change that, is changing them. And there are, you know, ways to do that, but, you know, I don't want to go too much through that. Uh, you're bombarded with questions, so I'll keep mine quite short, uh, but hopefully it will give you a chance to elaborate a little bit more on the trendsetter uh, idea, because I'm interested in the actorness uh, aspect of this chain yes. of events. To what extent or what is the motivation or what are the risk calculations of those who initiate the norm change? Because they s appear to be at least at the highest risk of exclusion, Punish, social punishment and so on. So Very if you care question. to elaborate a little bit more on, on that point. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, as we speak, I'm writing about that. And, uh, okay, there are psychological tests that you may do that measure what I call trendsetting characteristics, okay? And there are two sets of trendsetting characteristics. One is a very extroverted personality at the center of a network, a natural leader, etc. And my hypothesis is that these people will not change norms. Why? If I am a natural leader of the community, I'm not going to rock the boat. Okay? So who are the trendsetters that will try to change things? Peripheral members of the network. Why peripheral? Okay, first of all, you know, they are not at the center, so they don't have to support the particular norm. So they can have low sensitivity to it, no problem. Also, the risk perception, the risk perception will be lower because they are marginal, tangential. They are not at the, cent at the center, sorry, of the network. So the perception of the objective risk of doing something counter-normative, uh, you know, will be much lower than if you are at the center of a network. So there are various, uh, you know, if I, if I do a utility function for these people, there are certain parameters uh, that will matter. They need also a high level of self-efficacy. They have to believe 
that what they do will have an effect. Otherwise, there is no point in doing it. So I have all these parameters, uh, and uh, you know, I, I have a utility function, and now we are doing, uh, actually with Alex Funke, <laughs> uh, you know, some experiments about that. Okay, so I hope I'm right. <laughs> And uh, so, so this is, uh, uh, this is uh, one important thing. Another important thing is, uh, as Granovetter, you know, the great sociologist, uh, discussed that people have uh, thresholds. So suppose uh, that uh, we have uh, a small group of transceptors, okay, let's say five people, but our threshold is 10. <laughs> so what happens, uh, you will see a little hump and then, you know, nothing will happen an attempt to change, but then nothing will happen. And uh, I recently read a very interesting book uh, by uh, the very unsuccessful, but ultimately successful sit-in of black people in America, in the South. And it's very interesting because there were a lot of very unsuccessful sit-ins. So the students tried, but nothing happened. It's typically the student, because they have much less to lose uh, than a man who works and has a family, could be fired, etc. So when did they start succeeding? Basically when the number of students increased enormously in the Southern University and the media started covering it. Okay? So these are two reasons why, you know, these uh, trendsetters could be more easily followed, okay? Then there are various models we can have about, uh, you know, certainly there is no continuum of trendsetters, but there are a lot of ways uh, in which you can, uh, you know, imagine that there is a more continuous situation, so some trendsetters are more valuable to me, so my, uh, you know, my threshold is 10, but uh, you are my sister, and so your action counts for five, let's say. Okay, so there are all the, uh, Granovetter discussed that, it's not, uh, it's not me. So it is, uh, it is very important. What you see with these small groups, they are small groups of trendsetters, clearly. You know, they are people who get really more convinced than other people to change their beliefs about a certain practice. And typically, they are not the leader of the community. These I know, okay? But, uh, you know, we have to run simulations <laughs> you know, with various possibilities, etc. So, uh, you know, uh, I cannot say with uh, assurance, okay, that I am right. I have a hunch that this may be the case. Uh, there are three areas in the United States where things are changing quite quickly now. The view on homosexuality, religion, and drugs, cannabis. When do you think or if it ever happens that we will see a black homosexual woman <laughs> an atheist smoking dope on a regular basis, or at least inviting people to do so. Well, we still have to see a woman president <laughs> for all that matter, and there is a big problem there. Uh, you know, all, for example, I don't know if you have read recently how the popularity of Hillary Clinton went down. And uh, what do people think? She's not trustworthy, okay? She won't be a good leader, whatever it means. So it's very interesting. I think there are a lot of biases still against women in the United States, more than in Europe, because in Europe we had lots of heads of state, you know, that are women, etc. So there is that. When things will change, the homosexual story is very interesting because uh, I think uh, that, uh, first of all, the AIDS crisis made people change their view because their friends died. For example, it was a big scandal, Rock Hudson was gay. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> okay? So famous people who got AIDS and it was revealed that they were gay, sort of normalized, okay? The image of gay people, I think. People in their family have friends, have brothers or sisters or children, okay, who are gay. And so I think this uh, sort of change the perception, okay? 
And in particular, if you look uh, at uh, the typical traditional reaction to gay is disgust. You know, people were really disgusted. And the, they imagined, you know, the, intera the sexual interaction, they get really, uh, you know, upset. The interesting thing is, uh, if uh, it is your son, if it is uh, a friend, uh, will you still have this disgust reaction? I think this thing changed because, uh, you know, it was made much more public. I think the AIDS crisis helped, paradoxically, okay? Marijuana, another interesting phenomenon. There was a huge activist movement in Oregon about legalizing it uh, for, like, cancer sufferers or people who have certain diseases, et cetera. And Oregon is a very progressive state. And so, you know, they decided to legalize it. Controlled, but legalized. And now, sort of, uh, it is like a trendsetter state. And the question is, uh, will other states follow? I think the last one will be the Bible Belt states. Of course, they, you know, it will take a long, long time. But I think it will change, because it will be, again, normalized. Okay, is not a drug. Okay, you change basically the idea of what marijuana is. It's not really a drug. It's something that people can use when they do chemotherapy. Okay, or you know people who have uh, 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 like multiple sclerosis. Yeah, they seem to benefit, uh, and so there will be more and more acceptance. So I think there is a transcending level there. Okay, transcending movement. Oregon in that case, in the case of marijuana, in the case uh, of uh, uh, AIDS, all the campaign that people were made, very famous people like Liz Taylor about her friend Rock, Rock Hudson, you know, he was saying he was gay and that's okay. Okay, so famous people act as trendsetters. Okay, and start, people start seeing that there is something normal there that is not out of this world. Women uh, in power, again, things are changing because there are trendsetters. Okay, so I think the role of trendsetter is crucial in giving an example and sort of trying to change a script. Now, we have theories about script change, okay? And uh, one of the best uh, models of change is the bookkeeping model. And the bookkeeping model tells you that you have to be exposed over a long period of time to counter examples. So it's not just once, oh, there is Hillary Clinton, is the only woman, you know, etc. But you have to be exposed again and again to cases of women in power. So you cannot discount them. Okay? You cannot say, oh, it's exception that, confirm, uh, that confirms the rule. So this is a very important uh, point to keep in mind. Mm? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, <coughs> so I was wondering how uh, your work here relates to uh, the concept of social capital, uh, like Putnam's. Uh, oh, yes. So, for instance, I, I think about um, uh, in this. Uh, uh, you talked about how to overcome uh, co collective action problems and, and the role of uh, changing empirical expectations yeah. so it seems to me that the, uh, you, you talked about uh, how the role of a promise uh, like an explicit pr promise at a football stadium or whatever but it seems to me that social capital for instance could be understood as a kind of a default promise in certain groups that uh, 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 behavior will be reciprocated uh, uh, without these uh, like, uh, like explicit uh, promise making I think it's a, it's a very good question. Um, social capital may be understood as impersonal trust. Okay, so of course, uh, if you and I interact uh, repeatedly, you know, I will trust you provided, you, you know, we behave well with each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The interesting thing is impersonal trust. And uh, when we think about promising uh, in very limited situation, um, we couldn't talk of impersonal trust because people know each other. And that's why I talk of reputation, etc. The interesting thing is when you have these major promises as, uh, you know, villages promising, etc. Nobody has done a study about the level of impersonal trust in those communities. And I guess it should be relatively high. Because to believe 
you know, my community, you know, is promising with his community, your community, etc. And I don't really know you very well. So there must be a high level of impersonal trust. And uh, how it's created there, I have no idea. But there must be, because otherwise, uh, you know, I would say, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheap talk, basically. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. It was so coherent that it's difficult to ask problematic questions. <laughs> oh, ask, ask. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I have one. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, when uh, you talk about uh, inducing um, a normative change by discussion, yeah. okay, by putting forward the belief to the community for discussion as an effective mean of, uh, well, changing normative expectation and, uh, well, or changing a belief. Well, it seems like uh, 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 the idea of you put forward a belief or an argument and then things will accommodate. Uh, co uh, called accommodation, but yeah. there's another psychological, uh, psychosociological phenomenon that talks against that, which is polarization, yes. belief polarization. So yes. people may polarize another way, and they often do. So when you put forward an argument, they find better counter argument if they, 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 they uh, if they are against it, and the more, uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's a very good point, uh, um, and uh, Hugo you. Merci and I discussed that actually in that paper because uh, one result, uh, you know, very often of this discussion is polarization. We know that. the The issue is. Uh, uh, there are peculiar elements about this discussion. First of all, they are protracted. And second, uh, the attempt, many of these are organized, actually. Not all of them, but many of these, Tostan, were organized with the facilitator, which is very important, which prevents, okay, this uh, split of opinions, if you will. But another important element is, uh, uh, you know, the basically the capability that people, you know, if it is a good discussion, if it is an open discussion, if there are no power, you know, elements, which is very important, there could be, uh, is uh, basically looking at uh, how coherent are my beliefs, okay, with my values, for example, which are more important beliefs. So often the discussion is conducted in this way. So it's not, uh, you know, typically polarization, think of political polarization, is, uh, you know, oh, uh, you know, uh, freedom is the most important thing, okay? And uh, you talk about equality, and uh, you completely po we completely polarize, et cetera. In this, uh, in this case, uh, I think the interesting element is uh, that people talk about, uh, you know, certain activities, certain practices, and how, you know, very freely, openly, how these practices, practices fit with our beliefs, uh, the other beliefs we have, uh, the values we have, uh, etc. So it's a different kind of discussion. They don't have to make a point, okay? When you polarize, you want to make a point. You know, I want to make a point that freedom is more important than equality, okay? And uh, I think it's very, very important that in this discussion, especially when they are guided, uh, basically what people do is try to look at the practice. What do you think about the practice? You know, you're free to say what I think, the, the value, this value, et cetera, et cetera, the consequences. And then you are guided to think, OK, so these could be the consequences. And how do they fit with these other things that you say are important? So in a sense, you distract people <laughs> from the possibility of polarizing. That's my impression. Uh, you know, I, I look, uh, uh, Jerry Mackey and uh, Lejeune did some very nice work uh, on how this discussion take place. And uh, I would say that typically people are taken away 
from the possibility of uh, like sticking to one position, etc. They, they they are sort of guided to see all the facets and how they fit with things that we believe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's more like uh, an uh, uh, inquiring about things uh, than you know saying. So, but certainly this is uh, this is a potential problem in any discussion. Yes, I have a question about uh, you were talking about uh, people changing. Or the what? Um, uh, how do you say it? A scenario that you described that they induced aversive motions in um, to change behaviors um, and you were they were kind of um, how do you say it uh, um, when they have the uh, um, I hit the bodies and they have the food and they saw how the flies oh, yes, went. Uh, yeah. yes, yes, it disgust. was yeah, disgust, yeah, yes. some kind of aversive Very motion, aversive reaction. reaction. Yes. Is there any positive reinforcement instead to uh, use punishment when you want to change behavior the, in the group level? The interesting thing uh, is what happens in this community, yeah. they decide they want to change behavior. Okay. They decide they want to build uh, uh, latrines, uh, they want to keep them clean, they want to do that. Yeah. They realize immediately that there is a temptation, individual temptation, okay, to yeah. cheat, basically. So they realize that. They are not stupid. And so what they together, what they do, you see, they do decide it together. That's why it's legitimate and is acceptable. They together decide, like the cow jail, basically, they yeah. together decide that uh, they not only monitor, but punish deviations. So uh, it is very important that punishment is legitimate because think that uh, you, know, you didn't agree to anything and then I come and punish you. That's terrible, okay? Typically, punishment is legitimate because they all agree that this should be done and something else should be prevented. So this is an important exactly, thing. Exactly, but I was thinking, is there an uh, other way to do it more positively? Not the with punish, but with uh, positive reinforcement. Yes, instead. there is positive reinforcement. Punishment is individual. Positive yeah. reinforcement is collective. What they do and they love to do is they post at the entrance of a village a big, uh, you know, uh, piece of paper that say OD free, open defecation free, and they feel great towards other villages, that they are better than other yeah. people. Okay, some kind okay. of competition then. <laughs> so typically yeah. the positive reinforcement is group and the negative is individual. Okay, and uh, what other, uh, other uh, question? Uh, how do you deal with interest, uh, conflict in interests? I mean, you were talking about this uh, woman, that um, there was a script about how a good woman was, and it was a good woman that had sex in the end of the day with a man, and there is a kind of uh, conflict, interest conflict between men and women. Yeah, yeah exactly, because the man is missing uh, out. We say that. Maybe yeah. the woman thinks that's her, ho her, her role. You know, yeah. you think there is but, a conflict but, of I mean, interest. For the ma men, it's uh, is, uh, actually a negative punishment because he's losing uh, positive reinforcement sex if the woman doesn't do as he wants. And he would beat the woman. Yeah, exactly. This is what happens in these exactly. places. There is a lot of violence against women, but the, the interesting and sad thing is women accept it okay. because uh, this is the script of a good woman she doesn't behave, the husband punishes her, they say is right. Okay. That's an interesting thing. It's a script uh, which is shared by men and women. It's not that there is conflict of interest there. In your mind, in my mind, there is, not in their mind. All right, I think we have to stop here. So thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.